Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nadia Youssef. And today I'm very excited to have our featured expert return for yet another hour special, Dr. Mark Hyman. Hello. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mark Hyman is an 11-time number one New York Times bestselling author and the director mm. of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, where physicians spend time with their patients, listening to their histories, mapping their personal timeline, and looking at the interactions among genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that can influence long-term health and complex chronic diseases and issues. Today's topic, sugar <coughs> and we'll talk about your physiological effects from this drug and how to eliminate your sweet cravings so type in any questions you guys have below we'll get to it to the second half of this broadcast and uh, and as always all things sugar everything all sugar day. everything it'll it'll <laughs> be a good one uh, and as always remember this is for informational purposes only and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice but if you want to cut out sugar that's fine yeah of course <laughs> of course well welcome back thank you so much for Thanks coming for i know you're very on. very busy no i'm here this is my work <laughs> that's awesome and the last time we talked about health misconceptions mm. and um it's safe to say we're still talking about health misconceptions just more towards sugar yes so uh it's a big topic before even we go into that i want you to briefly kind of talk about back day like two million years ago how did we eat as hunters and gatherers versus how we eat today well if you believe in evolution we've been evolving for eight million years mm -hmm. we've only been eating grains and beans and agricultural foods for about 12,000 years so for most of evolution we were hunters and gatherers and the truth is we ate a very plant-rich diet the average hunter-gatherer ate about 800 species of plants mm -hmm. but they also ate wild animals and wild fish uh, and they actually ate a diet that was not including grains, not including beans, didn't have dairy unless you could milk a saber-toothed tiger, which is pretty hard. <laughs> they didn't eat sugar unless they found a honey <coughs> home, a honeycomb where the bees had made honey, and they'll get that pretty rarely, and it's also painful to get. Yeah. I mean, there's a group of um, hunter-gatherers in Nepal called the honey, honey hunters, and they literally climb up these trees that are like a few hundred feet tall, you know, which is dangerous enough. And then they bring a burning stick with smoke on it, mm -hmm. and they smoke out all the bees, and then they get the honeycomb. Imagine if you had to climb a 200-foot tree with a smoking branch in order to get a cookie. Well, that's kind of what it was like back then. And so we really had a very different diet than we do now. It was much more nutrient-dense, much higher in fiber, much more vitamins and minerals, higher levels of omega-3 fats. It had very, very low sugar and starch was a very different diet. And, and as we have shifted to eating a diet that's predominantly carbohydrates, which are predominantly driven through commodity crops from, from um, our agricultural system, which now is wheat and corn and soy and processed foods, we've really found ourselves in a pickle, which is the biggest obesity and diabetes epic in the history of the human race. So we're kind of in trouble because of our changes in diet. Now, I want to ask you, First of all, why do we crave sugar? What is the science behind that craving that we are all yeah. getting? Well, the, good, the thing is that anything sweet in nature mm -hmm. is safe to eat. If it's bitter, it could kill you. So our bodies are wired to eat sugar when we get a hold of it, whether it's a lot of fruit in the summer or whether it's honey or whatever it is, because when we eat something sugary, it actually allows us to store fat. Mm -hmm. And the way we store fat is not by eating fat, we kind of debunk that myth, which mm -hmm. is that fat makes you fat, and that we should be eating low fat this and skim that. Right. That's all nonsense. We know that now people who eat a calorie restricted, low fat diet, meaning they can only eat a very few calories and they have to be low fat, do far worse in terms of weight loss than people who are eating an unrestricted, meaning eat as much as you want, high fat, low carbohydrate diet, which sort of is the opposite of what we'd all been thought trained. But we, we now have to look at the amount of um, sugar we're eating as a drug because it affects the part of the brain that actually makes you addicted. So this dopamine response, like when you get a text on your phone, bing, it actually hits your brain chemistry and makes you feel a little bit of pleasure for a moment. The same thing happens with sugar or cocaine or heroin or all the addictive drugs and sugar does exactly the same thing. So we know mechanically how that works and there are some people, by the way, who have genetic variations in the receptors in their brain for dopamine mm. and these people need more stimulation to receive the same pleasure as somebody else mm. the bad news is when you are overweight you downregulate the receptors 
So the more overweight and obese you are, the less your pleasure centers work, which means you need more and more sugar and starch to actually stimulate the pleasure center. So you get this vicious cycle where you crave more, eat more, need more, and it's really an addictive drug. So we know that you go through withdrawal. If you think animals, you give them a lot of sugar, and then you actually cut the sugar out, they go through physiologic withdrawal, like an addict, like a heroin addict. Yeah. If you look at animals in studies where they give them either sugar or they can get cocaine, they literally have them hooked up to an IV, they hit the lever, they can get IV cocaine, they will s always prefer the sugar and they will switch, if they're already addicted to cocaine, they will switch to sugar and they'll work eight times harder to get the sugar than the cocaine. That's terrifying. That's frightening. That's terrifying. Well, let's talk about some of the labels for sugar that we can find um, in a box of something. And because Oof. I can't pronounce it, and Oof. I know there's like over yes. 60 or something. No, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of names yeah, for sugar. Yeah. Whether it's what, is, what is the most common one that we can see? Well, we see obviously sugar, mm -hmm. high fructose corn syrup, which is the most abundant ones. Uh, there's also, you know, names that they give things that are healthy, like coconut sugar or cane sugar or dehydrated cane juice or all these kind of names for mm -hmm. sugar that's really sugar. What is harder to know is that there's a lot of stuff that acts like sugar in the body, like maltodextrin and all these derivatives of sugar that are made from processed corn or that are added to the food supply. And if you just Google, you know, what are the 100 names of sugar or 200 names of sugar, you'll see there's a list and you can't even believe what's on there. And so often on a particular food, like a breakfast cereal, there might be five different kinds of sugar mm -hmm. or starch that is acting like sugar in the food. You don't even know it's sugar. Yeah, yeah. Now, I like the way you describe processed food. You say it's food-like substance, because it shouldn't <laughs> even be called food, which makes a lot of sense Right. To I mean, me. you look at a Twinkie, and you've got 37 ingredients. Sure. Only one of them is food, and it's down near the bottom of the list, and it's banana puree. Wow. So it might be a tiny drop of banana. Yeah. And the rest of it's just food-like ingredients. Chemicals, yeah. Chemicals, yeah. right. And I always say, you know, if you, if you don't have that ingredient in your cupboard and you wouldn't cook with it, you probably shouldn't eat it. Right. Whether right. it's maltodextrin, you don't have a bottle of high fructose corn syrup, nope. you don't have partially hydrogenated soybean oil, you don't have butylated hydroxytoluene, which is BHT, <laughs> right? If you can't pronounce it, if it's in Latin, if you don't yeah. even recognize it, if it says, you know, tomatoes, water, and salt, or sardines, olive oil, and salt, you know what it is, yeah, right? Yeah. Most Hard of the to time. Find. Right. So is there such thing as a healthy processed food? Yeah, sure. Okay. And like I said, there, there are foods, if you look at the ingredients and every one of them you recognize as food, it says cashews and dates and pumpkin seeds and it's a bar, it's fine. You know, turmeric, I had one this morning, it was a pumpkin bar. It said, you know, pumpkin seeds and quinoa and uh, I had like pepper and turmeric and mm -hmm. salt. I'm like, I don't, okay, this is food. I recognize everything on here. So yeah, you can have packaged processed food as long as it's, it's as close to its original state as possible. Sure. Okay. Great. Now jumping on to fructose. Now fructose is in fruit yes. because it's CJ has fiber with it is okay, yeah. but fructose by itself, dangerous. Yeah. So so everybody heard of high fructose corn syrup, right? Yes. Which didn't even exist until like the 1980s, mm -hmm. right? So right, it was like right. now it's, you know, a huge portion of our dietary sweeteners because it's cheap. The government subsidizes corn. I once talked to the vice chairman of Pepsi and he said, Mark, he said. The reason we use high fructose corn syrup is because the government makes it too cheap for us not to use it. Mm. And it's in everything. Uh, and so that's the problem is high fructose corn syrup is different than having, let's say, an apple, which has fructose in it, because the apple has fiber, it has vitamins and minerals, it's more slowly absorbed, it's fine. But when you take the fructose out of food, in fact, the vice chairman of Pepsi said to me, he said, fructose is the problem. He got it, he knows, he's, a, he's actually an endocrinologist from Mayo. Mm -hmm clinic, which uh, Toby Cosgrove thinks is uh, what you put on your sandwich, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so so he's, he's an extraordinary guy, but he, he's talking about how fructose is really the bad problem. Why? Because it goes to the liver. Mm -hmm. It doesn't increase insulin, it goes to your liver and it causes fatty liver, which now affects over 90 million Americans. Most people don't know they have it. Mm -hmm. It's caused from drinking soda and high fructose corn syrup and these, these fr free fructose. And a fructose corn syrup, normally sugar is 50% fructose, 50% glucose and it's bound together with a chemical structure. When you get high fructose corn syrup, it could be from 55 to 75% or more fructose, and it's free fructose, meaning it's just not bound to the glucose, and so it quickly gets absorbed. We know the fructose in the gut actually causes a leaky gut. Why? Because it takes energy from 
the gut to absorb it. And when you take energy there, then the things that, that, that are keeping the cells together like Legos, those require energy to keep together. They separate and then food and bacterial proteins and toxins leak into your bloodstream where 60% of your immune system is right under your gut and causes all sorts of inflammation. So you get fatty liver, you get diabetes, prediabetes, and you get all sorts of cardiovascular issues, heart disease, cancer, all this coming from these high levels of fructose. Now, is it true cancer like strives off of fructose, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The pathway to keep cancer going is sugar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, when they do diagnostics for cancer, they do something called a PET scan, which is where they basically tell you to starve yourself from carbohydrates and sugar for a few days. They inject sugar into you, radioactive sugar. They can see it goes right to the cancer. That's how the cancer wow. lights up because the cancer loves sugar and starch, I would say as well. We know that obesity and diabetes and prediabetes all have been linked to cancer. So this is well established in the science. So we know that sugar feeds cancer. Actually, they're doing studies on ketogenic diets in cancer, which is extremely high fat diet because your cells can run on sugar, meaning glucose, or something called ketones, which comes from eating a lot of fat and mm -hmm. cutting out the starch. Cancer cells can only run on sugar. So you cut out their food source, they die. That's the theory. And it's been shown to be often very effective in many difficult to treat cancers, which is now undergoing a lot of research. So it's kind of an interesting area, but the, the um, sugar and cancer thing is a, a real thing. So you're saying that if you cut out carbs, or at least that's what the study is trying to show, that cancer starves if you have no sugar in your body. Yeah, so there's guys like Dr. Um, uh, Mukherjee in, in New York who's studying, uh, he's an oncologist, she wrote the Emperor Malmali, he's mm -hmm. talking about a presentation I saw where he was talking about how melanoma and pancreatic cancer, are very difficult to treat cancers, we're actually seeing impressive changes. Yeah. That's being researched in brain cancer because the brain runs on ketones very well, but the sugar feeds the brain cancer. Yeah. So I think this is a promising area of research and we're going to learn more about it, but you know, maybe eventually part of the treatment for cancer, which is ketogenic diets. Wow, it's fascinating stuff. Now, I kind of want to talk about some of the <coughs> solutions. Um, something like herbs, spices, condiments, because we add sugar for flavor to make everything sweeter. Yeah. Is there a, a more natural way of adding things in that category of er herbs, spices, and condiments that we can add to our food? Yeah, part of the problem is, you know, we have really become addicted to sugar. Yeah. And our taste buds are highly stimulated by sugar. And artificial sweeteners, which often people go to, have a thousand times more sweet flavor than sugar right. or more. Right. So it's super overstimulated. So it makes you want even some it makes you want sweeter, even more, right? yeah. So it takes a little while to unhook from that, but mm -hmm. there's so many incredible natural flavors out there in nature from spices and herbs and condiments and salt and pepper that actually bring out flavors in food. And once people start to learn about that, it, it tastes so much better than sugar. Sure. I mean, sure. I, you know, sometimes I go to a Thai restaurant and it's like, they put so much sugar in yeah. all the food. And yeah. I, put, I mean, they put sugar in salad dressings. I was just going to ask you. Why is there <laughs> sugar in salad dressing, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't yeah. get it. But often your salad dressing, you get this bottled or commercially made or, you know, you go to McDonald's. It's actually pretty bad. And the salad's fine when you put the dressing on. It's worse than a Big Mac. Yeah. And I see a lot of people trying to eat healthy. And they get a salad mm. with steak or chicken, but then they get the dressing from the store. And the yeah. thing is, that dressing is kind of like what? ruins the whole thing. Well, yeah, right? I mean, usually it's refined vegetable oil, so it's not extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. It's high fructose corn syrup. It's gums and thickeners. Mm -hmm. It's additives and preservatives. Like, why would you put that on your salad? So I mean, stick to like oil and vinegar? I mean, honestly, I don't, I'm so lazy. I'll take my salad, put it in a bowl. Uh -huh. I'll pour olive oil on it. Yeah. I'll pour some vinegar on it. Uh -huh. I'll salt and pepper it. Yeah, and that's perfect. the whole salad. That's exactly, and that's, if I want to get fancy, perfect. I might put it in a jar and add some mustard and lemon. And Cumin. Cumin, spices, but you know, <laughs> I'm usually pretty lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're choosing to put this poison in our body when we eat sugar. I and and the scariest thing I actually watched. Well, we might be choosing. We might be addicted. We are totally addicted, but also knowing the information, just like what you're doing, is going around and talking yeah. about this. Um, our kids. You know, I'm a single mom of two kids, and I have total control of what the meal looks like. But the scariest thing is changing the habits of your children when they go out in the world and they get to pick, you know, an apple for a snack versus the Oreos or, or the goldfish. Um, because, you know, it's an epidemic for, for children right now with obesity, ADHD. Is, does if they ate whole goldfish, that would be fine. But not no, the not the whole <laughs> goldfish, but like the, the cracker kind they of goldfish. They get some omega-3s <laughs> some protein. Yeah, yeah. But um, so it is, it's very difficult to 
you know with your kids yeah with, with your kids but yeah. ADHD and and obesity for children this all does that come from diet as well huge I mean we know that dietary changes play a big role in our cognitive function and our mood and behavior mm -hmm. uh, and that there's in fact there's a whole field of research called uh, the achievement gap uh, dr. Charles Bosch from Columbia has looked at how our kids' diets and their health affect their ability to learn and function and their behavior in school. So these kids who tend to have all these processed foods can't function and think, actually here in Cleveland, I just met with a guy who started something called Pure Pantry Health, where he's bringing poor communities together and helping them learn how to eat healthy. And he's, he was a coach in basketball and he was tracking what these kids were eating, how they were functioning in school, how they were phasing out and spacing out and couldn't perform. And he asked them what they're eating. They're eating like flaming hot chips with red dye in it. We know that red dye, for example, drives ADD behavior. We know that, that these, these chemicals actually can affect behavior. We know that sugar uh, and lack of good healthy nutrients affects these kids' function. So we, we really need to focus on how do we change that. And I've seen schools where they've, they've literally charter schools with really poor neighborhoods, minority kids, very disenfranchised families. And they literally feed the kids three times a day. Yeah. Before the kids were going to jail, now they're going to college. They weren't finishing high school, and now they're ex excelling. And all the other kids in the neighborhoods and the, and the rich neighborhoods that want to send the kids to this school because they're feeding them three times a day and eating real food, and they're able to perform and function in school. So it plays a huge thing. And I think, you know, I once saw this video on uh, YouTube mm -hmm. of this baby who got sugar for the first time. And you look at the baby, and it's like, it's like crack. Oh the baby just yeah. gave him crack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think we get our kids used to this stuff and we think there's kids' food and kids' menus. I mean, breakfast cereals, you know, Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch and Cocoa Puffs. And I mean, the tricks are for kids. I mean, these are certified by the American Heart Association as heart healthy because they're low in fat, but they're full of dyes and chemicals and also tons of sugar. Seven teaspoons of sugar in a bowl of trick cereal for So breakfast. it's like a dessert and even an unhealthy dessert. Yeah, I always say you shouldn't call it breakfast, you should call it dessert. Yeah, yeah. I actually, my kids, when they ask me for cereal, I make them eat their eggs and their uh, vegetables and then I have them have their well, cereal. Well, I'm, I'm a dessert. cereal killer. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we should be eating cereal. <laughs> cereal killer, I like that one. <laughs> now, are these like kind of reversible with diet? So let's say I change my diet. Like I know diabetes yes. um, <coughs> is a huge yeah. one with, yeah. with uh, yeah. the diet. Diet, like keto yeah. diet, you can actually reverse? Yes. So, yes, yeah, so we know, that, for example, that, that sugar and carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, because vegetables are carbohydrates. We want to eat a lot of those, mm -hmm. but starch and sugar, flour predominantly, we eat 133 pounds of flour and 152 pounds of sugar. That's driving the fact that 70% of us are overweight, that one in two of us have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. That's massive. Half the population has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. One in four kids. Teenage kids have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. When I was in medical school 30 years ago, there wasn't a single case right. ever. Right. Now it's one in four, right? So how did that, how did that happen? It happens because of this high load of starch in the diet that raises insulin. We co get storage of fat, and we, we get this vicious cycle of causing diabetes. And now there's some amazing research. It uh, just came out uh, February 2018. It was about 250 patients, randomized trial. Uh, where they looked at type 2 diabetics who've been diabetic for a long time on insulin, on maximal medical therapy. They put them on a ketogenic diet, which is about 70% fat. I don't think it's for everybody, but it's for certain people who need to move the needle. And very, very low starch and carbohydrates, less than 50 to 30 grams, which is almost nothing. And they found in a year that 100% got off the main diabetes medication, which often causes side effects called oral hypoglycemics, and 94% got off insulin or dramatically reduced their dose, and they lost an average of 30 pounds, which is unbelievable, or 12% of their body weight. Wow. That's astounding. There's no drug that can do this. There's no other medication or shot that can actually do this result, and that's the power of food. So we actually can reverse diabetes. You know, it's funny. Actually, um, my mom's a type 2 diabetic, and I talk to her all the time about what you say about ketogenic diet, about fasting, <coughs> everything like that. Mm -hmm. She went on the ketogenic diet for a week, Dr. Hyman, and her what numbers happened? went down to 104, which is, she said it's a number that she hasn't seen in six years. She's been diabetic for over 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. So it's just fascinating what yeah. you can do, what, what you put in your body can completely eliminate medicine. That's huge. That's, that's great. Huge. Now, I want to kind of uh, jump off to uh, a true and false kind of game. So okay. I'm going to hope I my people games. stay on cheat. Love games. All right. So um, 
fruit juice. Tell me true or false. So tell me true or false, and then explain, um, you know, why yes or no. Then you so, answer true or false. Well, I'll, I, I think I'll know because I researched this, but <laughs> in case you don't know, I'll help. Fruit juice is healthier than soda because of the antioxidants. Not really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, okay, you get a few vitamins, a few antioxidants, but essentially fruit juice is just like drinking soda. And it's also got high fructose, which is not a great thing. Mm -hmm. So juice boxes and all these healthy juice drinks, it's really not much better than soda, and it, and it drives the same kinds of biology of weight gain, diabetes, obesity. So don't think juice is a healthy drink. Now, right. how many apples need to get in one glass of juice? Probably five. Eat the five apples. Good luck with that. You mm -hmm. probably won't get through the first two. Sure, right. Okay, um, after a workout, a sports drink is the best way to restore your electrolytes. Absolutely not. You don't want to be having blue drinks or orange-green drinks or whatever yeah. are with all sorts of sugar and a little bit of electrolytes. You know, the best way to do it is actually you can get things that are powders or they're just electrolytes. I often have this liquid kind they use, which I use a capful and a glass of water. It's, it's a little salty-tasting water. It's not the best thing to drink, but you down it. All of a sudden, you feel like you're like a million bucks. I do when I'm playing tennis in summer, it's super hot, or playing basketball, and I get wiped out. A little of that just revives you completely. All right. Skip the sugar. Skip the sugar. Now, the now, if you're an elite athlete and you're training a long time, you might need a little bit of carbohydrate. Sure. But yeah. for the average Joe, that's not the way to go. Even after a workout. Um, desserts are the main course of added sugar in the American diet. No. Is it breakfast? It could be breakfast. I mean, you know, all the I cereal mean, talk, I'm guessing a, it's breakfast. If you breakfast. have a huge, one of those mocha, frappuccino, oh, latte yeah. something mm -hmm. at Starbucks, that can have 76 grams of sugar. That's like two Cokes for breakfast, <laughs> right? Oh, wow. It's like two Cokes. And um, most of the breakfast we have in America is basically sugar. Donuts, muffins, bagels, uh, cereal, waffles, pancakes. Th this is not what we should be eating. We should be eating protein and fat for breakfast. So the biggest source of sugar in the American diet, and up to 15 to 20 percent of calories in some communities is soda, sugar sweetened beverages. Okay, great. The best artificial sweetener is none at all. Yes, that is true. true. Although there's monk fruit, which is not really artificial. It's from a traditional Chinese fruit that has no calories, but actually has a sweet taste, and that can be used. But what is that called? Monk fruit. Monk. Monk, oh, as in like a praying like a monk. monk. Okay, yeah. great. What about, um, I know we talked about honey a little bit earlier, but is honey, people think of like, I can put honey on my tea. Here's the problem. It's not the sugar that you add to your food. It's the sugar that's added by corporations. You can get 15 teaspoons of sugar in one 20 ounce soda, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't put 15 teaspoons of sugar in your coffee or in your cereal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fine to add a teaspoon of sugar or a teaspoon of honey or a teaspoon of maple syrup. That's not the problem, mm -hmm. right? It's the 34 teaspoons you're eating every day, day in and day out. Yeah, that sounds very dangerous. Um, you should eat at least five servings of fruit each day. Well, we are told to eat five servings to nine servings of fruit and vegetables every day, which is good, except it should be vegetables and fruit. It should be seven of fruit and probably, sorry, seven of vegetables and two of fruit. Because fruit, okay. especially for our population, listen, if you're healthy and you're an athlete, fine, you can eat more fruit. But for the average person who's overweight, who's diabetic, this is not a great food for you to take in large quantities. You, you want to have a big bowl of pineapple or a big bowl of grapes. I mean, this is going to raise your blood sugar significantly. So you want to cut that down, have some, but it's not the main staple. What are the worst offenders? Pineapple, grapes. Pineapple and grapes. <laughs> Bananas aren't so great. Uh, there's Bananas a are not great. Mm -mm. You can look at the glycemic index or glycemic load of fruit, and you can kind of look at that. I, I wrote a book called Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And in the book, I had go through, you know, from top to bottom, what are the lowest glycemic fruits to the highest glycemic fruits, and also fruits and vegetables. You know, what are the best vegetables to eat? In America, we eat the five most common vegetables, which is basically potatoes in the form of French fries, <laughs> tomatoes in the form of ketchup and pizza sauce, uh, so tomatoes, uh, french fries, pizza, and ketchup are basically the main staples for the American diet. Also, we have onions and sweet corn in there, and then of course there's iceberg lettuce, which is essentially uh, sawdust uh, with like some water in it. <laughs> so. Okay, now I want to talk about bananas real fast, because a lot of people are like, well, I eat my bananas for potassium, but I've read that avocados have yeah, more potassium yeah. than bananas. Uh, well, I mean, listen, all plant foods, vegetables, have a lot of potassium. Okay. So, 
I, you can make a potassium broth, just take a lot of veggies and greens and boil them up and make the, like a vegetable broth that's going to be full of potassium. Okay. Much better than bananas without the sugar. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's go to the next one. It's the last one I have for you. Buying organic is a waste of money. No. Okay. <laughs> there, <laughs> the issue is, we, if you look at the studies that are funded by the food industry and by Monsanto and the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry that makes these stuff, they're going to find that they're not a problem. But when you look at independent studies, they are clearly a problem. They contribute to cancer. They contribute to autism and ADD behaviors in kids. They contribute to chron all sorts of chronic diseases. So you want to minimize your exposure to toxin in your life. And food is the one of the easiest ways to do it, one of the most abundant sources of toxins. Mm -hmm. So in, I'm on the board of this group called the Environmental Working Group, and they have uh, something called the Dirty Dozen, which are the 12 most contaminated vegetables and fruit, and then the Clean 15, which are the 15 least contaminated. So if you're having an issue with your budget, you can buy the Clean 15 vegetables and fruits and stay away from the the dirty dozen. Mm. For example, strawberries are the worst. You never want to eat those unless they're organic. I have and no idea. Yeah, and so there's, there's a list of those in the book as well, food, what the heck should I eat, and you can look at all the different uh, ratings, and you also go to the Environmental Working Group website, ewg.org, and there's a list of how do you reduce your exposure through your food, through meat, through fish, through ho household cleaning products, through your, um, through also your, um, your face and makeup products, all that is on there. So it's important to sort of be smart about reducing your exposures to toxins. Okay, great. You made it through the true and false. Um, I I'm did? Actually, did I pass? You did. I think you passed. <laughs> so um, we're getting a lot of live questions. I do have some uh, pre-submitted questions that I'm going to read off okay. real fast so it can all be right. fair for everyone. So Eileen um, asked, how does a ketogenic diet fit in this elimination <coughs> of sugar? I know we talked about this. One of my doctors at Crystal Clinic suggested that I start this diet. Ah. Are you on board with putting your body in to a state of ketosis. And if you just want to describe a little yeah. bit about what ketosis is. I bet is. I know the doctor. Her name was Carrie Dayulis, wow. right? <laughs> so uh, she's a good friend of mine, uh, and she wouldn't mind me saying this. She's a diabetic, type 1, and she takes almost no insulin, and she's on a ketogenic diet, wow. which is pretty amazing for a type 1 diabetic. Okay. She's like one or two ingredients a day. So if you have a particular issue. I think ketogenic diets can be therapeutic. I don't think they're necessary for everybody, but they can lead to rapid weight loss. They can lead to reversal of diabetes. They can stop epilepsy that nothing else works for. They're effective in autism. They're effective in Alzheimer's. They're effective in uh, neurocognitive other behavioral issues sometimes. So there it may be even in cancer. So there, there are many indications for it, but I don't think it's for everybody. So yeah. essentially what it is is you switch from burning sugar in your cells to burning fat. And when you do that, all of a sudden, you change the fuel source, which is ketones. Ketones becomes the fuel source. Your body has a backup fuel system. So for, let's say you, you didn't get to eat all day because you're hunter-gatherer and you ran out of food. Well, you could then switch to burning fat. And you have you know, a lot of fat stored on your body, so you can literally mobilize the fat and burn the fat as a way of getting fuel. You can also do it by cutting down the carbohydrates and increasing the fat to about 70% fat. And it can be very powerful. It has some amazing effects. It can cause you to basically reverse all the process of aging. It upregulates your mitochondria, it improves your gene expression, reduces inflammation, improves your, all your cardiometabolic risk factors, reduces all the things. That it may increase stem cells. It may actually increase longevity. So we're looking at all the research on this now. It's pretty fascinating. Great. And then I know you've talked about do not mix the two. Don't eat too much fat yeah. and then too much sugar or carbs because then you call right. it sweet this is fat. A that's really very dangerous and I feel yeah. like everybody should probably hear this from you. Very important. Thank yeah, you, Nada. Sure. But <laughs> here's the deal. When you eat fat and a lot more fat, you can't combine it with starch and sugar. So when you do that, it's called sweet fat. Think of donuts, bagels and butter, uh, you know, French fries, ice cream, where you combine fat and starch or fat and sugar. That's deadly. Why? Because when you eat the sugar, it's going to increase the insulin, and then your fat and everything's running around your blood, it all gets stored. You're going to gain a lot of weight. Mm. So you can't eat sweet fat. If you're going to cut down uh, on the starch, that's okay. But if you increase fat without cutting down the sugar and starch, you're going to get in trouble. So this relates to ketosis. Uh, Mike asks, when you're in ketosis, will your body burn dietary fat first or the stored fat first? Uh, great question. <coughs> Both. It'll, it'll burn the fuel you're eating as fat, mm -hmm. but it'll also start to mobilize fat. So the, the interesting thing is sugar 
start, it really creates a one-way street of food and calories into your fat cells. It gets in there really easily and it can't get out. It's like a one-way turnstile. It's stuck in there mm -hmm. uh, because it inhibits what we call lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. So that, that's a basically a biochemical mechanism where we stop the burning of fat and the release of fat from stored fat if we act... Is my microphone not working? Yeah, Getting okay, that better? Closer. Does that sound better? So <laughs> there's... <laughs> You know, there's uh, basically a releasing of the fat when you start to eat fat. It, it actually increases the release of fat from the fat cells and increases your metabolism when you eat a ketogenic diet. Great. <coughs> now, I want to ask you about fasting. I'm a big fan of fasting. Um, does your body go through ketosis as well through fasting? Mm -hmm. um, can we yeah. talk maybe a little bit about that? Because I actually just watched a documentary again about benefits of fasting. And it was yeah. Phenomenal stuff. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, the only thing we know mm -hmm. that actually increases longevity and you can increase your life by up to a third is what we call calorie restriction, meaning you, you cut your calories by a third. Now, the problem with that is that you're miserable all the time because you're hungry. So I'm not a fan of mm -hmm. <laughs> So there's things called fasting mimicking diets, which is essentially a we call intermittent fasting, which is where you will restrict your calories or your food to an eight-hour window or time-restricted eating. So you'll, let's say, eat dinner at six or seven at night, and you won't eat till lunch the next day. And the reason that works is because it activates all the repair mechanisms in your body. It actually helps to renew your mitochondria and cleans up all the waste from your cells and your brain. It helps to stimulate stem cell production, which rejuvenates you. It helps to reduce inflammation, increases all your cardiometabolic factors. It increases ketones and helps to actually start to mobilize and burn fat from your fat cells and lose weight. So there's so many benefits to it. Extended fasting, where you don't eat or you just drink water for a week or two or three, can be a very effective treatment for conditions like autoimmune disease or type 2 diabetes. Um, it's not something you can do forever, obviously. You've got to eat, but it's a careful with that because you, you don't eat and then you refeed and you, you, know, you can get into trouble if you don't do it right. But there's actually a great guides to fasting. Uh, Jason Fung, a doctor in Canada, has written a book called The Complete Guide to Fasting, which is a great manual for understanding fasting. Now, if you're eating a little bit of carbs and fat and everything like that after your fast, how long does it take your body to go to, to, through ketosis? when you're fasting? Is it just like eight hours of fasting, 12 hours well, of yeah, fasting? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, often if you, if you don't eat for 12 hours, you'll start to go into 12 that. hours, yeah. okay. So Great. then, you know, overnight, you know, you eat, and then overnight your body starts burning the food, and then, you know, basically, uh, if you can extend it out to lunch. There's also hacks sure. where you can actually add MCT oil, which hmm. builds ketones in your body, so I there's see. a lot of tricks. Okay, Dr. Hyman, we have so many questions coming live, so I'm going to start going through Go. this. All right, so first I have Hassan. Is replacing fizzy cola drinks with carbonated water beneficial? I am addicted to cola. Yes, it's definitely beneficial. Make sure you get rid of the soda, and if you want carbonated drinks, there's ones like Spendthrift, or what is it called? Spinthrift, I think it's called, which is a great drink. I don't have any relationship with any of these companies financially, but this is a product that has a tiny bit of fruit juice. It's sparkling. And it's like a it's like a fake soda, but it's very very good, and it doesn't have any really any substantial sugar in it. So there's all kinds of things like that. There's like flavored lemon, w sparkling water. There's all sorts of things you can do, but it's, you got to get off the soda. All right, Susan. Hi, Dr. Hyman. I eat a primarily vegetarian diet, but still can't drop weight. I have a very small amount of chocolate a day. Can <coughs> this really be <coughs> stopping me from losing weight? Yeah, it's a big question about vegetarian vegan diet. So. The key is what are you eating, right? Because you can eat a vegan keto diet, mm -hmm. which is extremely low carb, very high fat, or you can eat a vegan, vegetarian, very high carb diet, which most people will do because they eat grains, they eat beans, they eat starchy stuff. Most vegans and vegetarians will crave sugar because they're a little bit out of balance in terms of their biology. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough. And when you're eating foods that turn into sugar, whether it's, even if it's brown rice or kidney beans, it will still lead, if you have weight issues and you have insulin resistance, it will still lead to some of these problems. So I'd encourage you to sort of look at the reasons why. I mean, I think people can be vegan or vegetarian for moral reasons. Okay, that's fine. If you're a Buddhist monk, no problem. For environmental reasons, which I think is important because we shouldn't be eating feedlot cows because they're the number one contributor to climate change. It's inhumane of how we raise them. We use tons of antibiotics, pesticides, the food they give them, creates lower quality meat. It's just a whole series of issues with it. So it's bad for you, bad for the planet and bad for the environment. 
But grass-fed meat is very different. So when you look at the overall issue of environment and moral, fine. But the health issues are quite different. And when you looked at the research, there's very little evidence that meat is a problem in terms of our health, especially grass-fed meats and more sustainably raised animals. In fact, they're critical to help restore the environment by rebuilding soils, by sequestering carbon, holding water. That's a whole field called regenerative agriculture. But the, the health issues are really important to distinguish from these environmental and other issues and how, what kind of meat we eat, the quality matters. Yeah. So I, I think you know, the, 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 they have to look at the reasons. And I think people who do more um, higher fat, moderate protein, very low starch and carb, uh, do far better in terms of weight loss. And, and, and this has been shown over and over again. There's a study of uh, 53 studies, it was a review paper, that were randomized controlled trials lasting a year or more, and the low-fat group did high, far better than the low-fat group. Mm -hmm. The high-fat group did better than the low-fat group, but the high-fat was also low-carb. And the bigger the difference in the fat and the carb, the more the weight loss. Wow. And you've done all kinds of stuff, right? You've done vegetarian, you've done paleo. Yeah, I was a vegetarian for 10 years. In fact, I actually... Um, was with a friend the other day who I was friends with in my 20s and she was showing me some pictures and we were out you know at a beach or something and I had no shirt on I'm like wow and my body I was a vegetarian I was running five miles a day I was doing yoga I was healthy and my body was just scrawny mm -hmm. and I'm 58 and compared to when I was 28 I'm far more muscular far more you know defined and less body fat and much deeper uh, level of health than when I was 28 because I switched my diet getting off of all the starch and sugar. Okay, and explain that. Is it the, is it the protein? Yeah, it's, the it's, meat? it's getting off all the starch and sugar. Okay. I mean, when you, when you and, and it's also the higher fat diet, which actually stimulates yeah. muscle building. This has been shown over and over again in human and animal studies. Lean body mass increases with good quality protein and fat, mm -hmm. and it decreases with sugar and starch. Wow, great. And then I have uh, Debbie. What are your thoughts on a plant-based whole foods eating plan? And that's kind of what we just talked about. Well, I just about. talked about that, but yeah. I, think, I think it's important that we look at the reasons why. If you think it's for health reasons, I would challenge those assumptions. I would check out my book, uh, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat, where I go through all the research. I explain the controversies about meat. I explain what the differences are mm -hmm. and the kind of meat that has different effects. And I think we just really need to look again at this. And I, 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 I will talk about it in a minute, but the Dietary Guidelines group hasn't really reviewed the research on meat. They basically assumed it's bad because it has saturated fat. Saturated fat, they say, is bad, which it's not. Mm -hmm. And then you should not eat meat because of that. And there's very little data to support that. In fact, there's a lot of data that doesn't support that at all. Right, right. Well, um, kind of going back to sugar real fast, Kimberly, what kind of foods would you suggest eating to get you through the sugar cravings? And I'm getting a lot of these questions about how to curb your, your sugar cravings. Yeah, right. So I wrote a book about sugar addiction. Yes. It was called The 10-Day Detox Diet. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially a program to get you unhooked. And the secret is dramatically cutting out the starch and sugar. So cold turkey. It's not like, well, I'm just going to have, you know, a couple of shots of heroin today or a couple of lines of cocaine. I'm just cutting down on my, you know, you've got to, like, stop. Cold turkey. And the second thing is you've got to dramatically increase fat because fat is what makes you stop craving. And within a day or sometimes less or two at the most, it'll all go away. Your brain okay. chemistry will change. Your hormones change. That's how fast food works. It's literally like medicine. Wow. Wow. So cut the sugar, cut the carbs. And increase the starch. And increase, and increase the, the fat. fat. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, Erica wants to know, how do you help children kick the sugar habit, and what foods do you suggest for younger picky eaters? Well, in my um, house, there was only two things on the menu. <laughs> Take it or leave it. <laughs> I like it wasn't it. a restaurant. Yeah. There was no menu. <laughs> it was not like, I want this. I want this. No, this is what we ate, and it was all real food. And... The fact is that we have this view of kids' food in America, which is so dangerous and so harmful, and it's why 40% of kids are overweight in this country, why you know, one in six has some neurodevelopmental issue often related to what we're eating. Yeah. And the truth is that, that we know actually um, that, that we can feed kids real food and they will eat it right from an early age. I mean, think about what they eat in Japan. Kids eat raw fish and seaweed. <laughs> in Indonesia, they eat Indonesian food. They, there's no kids' menus or kids' food. It's an, it's an invention of the American food industry, which has been so detrimental and mm -hmm. harmful to our health. So I, I encourage you to make your home a safe zone. Start very early feeding your kids whole foods, real food. Get them involved in cooking and playing with their food, enjoying it. 
And my kid, my, my son now is a chef. That's what he does for a living. He like awesome. goes around teaching people how to cook healthy and eat healthy and throws these parties where he makes amazing food and teaches people about health and food. And he, he went off track for a little bit in college, but he <laughs> came right back and he, you know, he's actually doing it for a living now. So you can get your kids inspired and they, and they will follow along. Sometimes kids when they're teenagers will go off and want to eat McDonald's or whatever, but mm -hmm. all their friends are doing it. But if you've built the foundation in their home, you don't have to worry. So be the example. Yeah. Right? Family dinners every night. Not yes. family dinners. The average family dinner, people don't have family dinners, but the, if they do have them, they last 20 minutes or less while they're all eating a boxed food from another, made in different factories, heated in the microwave, while they're watching TV or yeah. on their phones. Right. That's not a family dinner. Family dinners have been shown, which I did every night with my family. I cooked, I worked, I cooked, I came home, I made real food, I sat down with them, we enjoyed each other. If families do that, there's lower rates of obesity, of eating disorders, better school performance, all sorts of benefits that come to families and kids when you eat at home with a family dinner. And then, um, just like we talked about the restaurants, going to a restaurant and you order a nice salad, but then kids want to go off the kids' menu and everything is mac and cheese, hot dogs, and, and chicken Chicken tenders. fingers. I didn't think but chickens had fingers. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> All right, let's go up to Sue. Um, <coughs> is stevia okay? And then related, Connie is also asking, I know not all stevia is good, but can you tell us what to look for in a good stevia? Well, usually when people start to ask these questions, it's a sign that they're addicted to sugar. <laughs> because nobody's going to be negotiating, well, can I have stevia? Can I have this? Can I have that? I would just take a good look in the mirror and go, why am I asking that question? Is it because I'm a sugar addict and I'm trying to substitute the sugar that I'm eating for something I think is better for me? Yeah. So most artificial sweeteners we know now are linked to obesity, diabetes, they alter the gut microbiome, they create inflammation. They're not a free lunch, right? They're, they're calorie free, but they're not a free of effects on your biology that's causing disease. As far as stevia goes, I think we still don't know enough about it. There are uh, studies that show it may not be as bad in terms of raising insulin and other effects, but it's still, it's, it's not something I would consider a free food. It's a treat. And I would encourage you to just use a little bit of regular sugar if you want to sweeten something. And the re Rebicide A is an extract of sugar that's made by uh, Cargill and Pepsi and Coke. There's two kinds, Purevia and Truvia. And, and there are sort of extracts of stevia, stevia. Now the question is, how are they bad or not? I, I, I would prefer people use a whole plant stevia. It's a little bitter, but uh, that's what I would suggest. Okay. Is, is sugar ever okay to eat? I mean, you just mentioned it as a treat. Mm -hmm. What is a treat? How often is a treat? Right. <laughs> I think of sugar as a recreational drug, right? Okay. It's like tequila or vodka, whatever. You don't want to have a bottle of vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, sure. which is essentially what we're doing with sugar. So yes, enjoy sugar from time to time add it to yourself or know how much is in there. Don't eat processed foods which have a lot of hidden added sugar and, and enjoy it. Don't feel bad, don't feel guilty, but understand it's a recreational drug and the dose makes the poison. So we should be having less than five teaspoons a day at the max, even less depending on whether or not you're on a ketogenic diet or not. But it really is important to not go overboard. We're eating four to 10 times that. Wow, okay, very good. Um, Cassandra wants to know what are good snack ideas without sugar? No snack ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, I you know I eat a lot of protein and fat. I travel a lot. I have a bag. I call. I have an emergency food pack. And uh, if you go online, you can go to my website, drhyman.com, and you can watch the emergency food pack video where I literally show you. It's like a magic trick. I put all this stuff in this big bag. But basically, it's a lot of protein and fat. So I have, uh, you know, bison jerky or grass-fed beef jerky. I'll have nuts, for example, or seeds, pumpkin seeds, cashews, almonds, walnuts. I'll have nut butter packets, I'll have coconut butter in a packet, I'll have um, almond butter, cashew butter, all these things I, I basically have, have in my bag. Uh, I got something here, but I'm very careful when I look out, I make sure it's all whole ingredients. So I found like the pumpkin seed bar with quinoa mm -hmm. and like turmeric and salt, so I'll crunch on that. There's stuff out there, but you have to be really smart. Uh, I know what you're doing. Great. Um, Tracy, what about alcohol consumption? Vodka and club soda qualify as keto friendly. How do you still wisely choose in social scenarios? Well, yeah, so again, remember it's a drug, right? So dose makes the poison. And I think, um, you know, alcohol can be helpful in small doses like a glass of wine or a, an ounce of alcohol like tequila or vodka. And it depends on you. You know, if you're an alcoholic, no, right? But if you uh, can tolerate and you enjoy it, I think it's okay. It's just a matter of the dose and how much and when. If you eat it after a meal, if you eat it before a meal, 
it's going to have a much more adverse effect on your blood sugar and insulin than if you eat it with a meal or after a meal. Oh, good to know. I didn't know that. Um, we have <coughs> Monica. How does eating the occasional sugary treat affect health? For instance, special occasions like birthday cakes or social situations where someone serves dessert. Those are the situations most tempting for me. I um, feel like I'm being rude if I decline the serving. If you can have a serving, have a bite. <laughs> <laughs> Just your bite, that's good. Uh, you know, if you, it depends on you. Like, listen, yeah. if you ran 10 miles that day, go ahead and have the dessert. If you're sitting around on the couch and not exercising and you're 100 pounds overweight, probably not a good idea. Yeah, all right. And then, Shelly, how about dates and figs dried? Are they bad for you? Oh, we got a lot of sugar addicts out there. Yeah, there's tons. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about. So. <laughs> yeah, they're okay. Uh, dried fruit is pretty concentrated sugar and sweet. Yeah. Uh, but it's got a lot of other nutrients and benefits to it. So, again, it's not like you have 10 figs or 10 dates. You know, having a date or a fig is fine. Uh, there's dates, sugar, and fig uh, sweetened products out there, which are okay. But, again, it's not a free food. Okay. And what about Roland? Roland? He wants to know, what is your opinion on a diet high in antioxidants and free radical effects on aging and inflammation? Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a diet high in antioxidants, which is essentially a plant-rich diet. I don't call it plant-based. I call it plant-rich, which is lots of vegetables and non-starchy vegetables mostly, some fruits, which are like berries, which are powerful antioxidants, eating foods that are anti-inflammatory, like whole foods, get away from processed foods, from a lot of sugar and starch, carbohydrates, which are all inflammatory, eating more of the good fats, which are anti-inflammatory, all that's going to really help you deal with aging and chronic disease. Okay. And then I have Sheila. What about baby formula? Are we addicting our kids from birth? Great question. Yeah, that is a good <laughs> so question. So if you look at the ingredients on formula, they're not that great. It's soybean oil, it's a lot of sugar, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it turns out that the kids who have a lot of formula tend to have more obesity, they tend to have more gut issues, there's all kinds of issues. So I'm not a big formula fan. I think people should breastfeed till about a year and then they should cut it off. They can breastfeed for two years if they want, which is what most populations do. And then they don't need to switch to milk, they don't need to switch to formula. They can eat real food. And you know, it's tough, not everybody's breastfeeding, but in the, you have to use formula, you have to use formula, but it's, mm -hmm. it's really not the most ideal thing. Okay. And um, Kathy wants to know if there's any healthy bread that is okay to eat. Yes. I mean, I basically, my rule for bread is if you can stand on it and it doesn't squish, you can eat it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> these are very dense, either nut and seed breads, which you can make, the recipes online. I think there's one called the world's healthiest bread or something. Uh, there's, ger if you're not gluten sensitive, there's something called German rye bread, which is not like traditional rye bread, but it's actually made from whole kernel rye. It's like black and it's dense and it's thin. You toast it, it's really good. All right, great. Um, Eblen is asking, if vitamin D deficient is told by a doctor, how many milligrams do I need to take daily? Great question. So if you're vitamin D deficient and your doctor says you are, it's probably bad because the ideal level is 50 to 60 and most labs are either 20 is deficient or 30. So most of us are insufficient or really deficient. And it's important because vitamin D regulates so many important things for us. So you want to get your level between 50 and 60. Now, some people don't need that much to do that. Some people need a lot. It depends on your genetics. So you have to test and measure. But usually, whatever your level is, let's say it's 20, it takes 1,000 units to get 10 points increase. So if you mm -hmm. want to get to 50 and you're at 20, you need 3,000. So wow. it's like that. Wow. All right. But the average person probably between two and 4,000 a day is the right amount. OK. Now, uh, Milu, Milu, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Great information, but how can we fight the cravings, the anxiety for sugar? Well, that's what I said. The 10-day detox is basically a sugar addiction detox. It's mm -hmm. like a rehab for sugar. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really easy to do, and every day there's a different set of steps, and you want to make sure you're following them. But I can tell you within 12 to 48 hours, you're going to be fine. And I've had people come and say, I've been addicted to sugar my whole life. I'm never going to be able again, and go on and on about their cravings. And within 48 hours, you're like, oh my God, I feel totally different. All right, great. And then Linda, is extra potassium needed when you're on a keto diet? Extra salt is needed. What happens is when you have a lot of sugar and starch, you increase insulin. Insulin makes you hold on to salt mm -hmm. or sodium and hold on to water. So what happens if you switch from very high starch, sugar diet to a very high fat, low carb diet? You're going to drop tons of water which is a good thing because that's inflammation, and you're going to lose a lot of salt. So you actually need to increase your mm -hmm. salt intake 
especially as you're switching over because you'll get what we call the keto flu, which means you feel lousy because you're not getting enough salt. Hmm. Okay, um, I like a lot of pickled everything, pickled vegetables. Is that, is that like a healthy thing? Is there a lot yeah, of sugar in that? No, not, no sugar? not usually. Okay. You can get sugary pickled vegetables, but okay. no, not usually. But the, the truth is that most um, fermented foods have been used for centuries, but we didn't have refrigerators, so people ate sauerkraut. I mean, mm. there was a funny study I saw where these Polish women in Poland eat about 30 pounds of sauerkraut a year. Wow. And then when they move to America, they get much higher rates of breast cancer, uh, and they stop eating the sauerkraut. Wow. <laughs> and there may be a connection there, and it may be because of how it affects your gut flora. So fermented foods are really good for your gut flora. Great. And then Allison's asking, um, what do you recommend as a long-term schedule for intermittent fasting? Like how many days to do it per week? I find that it helps with my back pain. Yeah. I mean, you can do it every day. I mean, some people are, you know, eat dinner by 7 and don't eat until noon the next day. That's fine to do. Not everybody should do it because if you're very thin, if you're uh, pregnant, if you're a kid, if you have medical issues, you want to be careful about it. Mm -hmm. But for the average healthy person, especially if you're you know, diabetic, overweight, it can be very effective. Now, I know we're talking a whole lot about processed foods. And our next Facebook Live will be in June. And uh, it will be about processed foods. So we'll talk a what lot day? more about that. Yeah, no, doing? I don't even know the day yet, but I'll let them know for sure. But I want to talk about the like, most terrifying thing that you've ever mentioned was about the cheese. I'm going to say in cheese because it's not really cheese, so that's why I'm putting quotations. But can you talk a little bit about the singles, the the, the singles that you well, buy right. from I mean, the store look, that I, are I in was the fridge? Joke, I always joke. You know, most of what we eat is not really food. It's food-like substances. I remember I was like uh, in Haiti after the earthquake and hadn't eaten for three days. I'd been like leaving on a few Cliff bars and some bottled water we brought in. And the military shows up and they have these meals ready to eat. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I went to the one of the soldiers and I said, can I have one because we haven't eaten in like three days. He's like, sure. So I picked out chicken and dumplings because it was a very stressful time and I found a comfort food and it sounded good. Sounds so I went to the back of the surgery suite, I heated up and I was reading the label and had like 500 ingredients and right. I like didn't see the word chicken. So what it was a chicken-like substance, right? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of what we eat is, is not really food and, and we want to be eating real food because when you eat the junk, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not actually food. Wow. So some of the cheese items so out the there. Yeah, so the cheese, the cheese thing is interesting because the government has a regulation. You have to have more than 51% cheese to call it cheese. So they call it American slices or craft slices, right? Wow. <laughs> but it's not really cheese. It's what you see on all the McDonald's hamburgers or the fast food burgers. It's not actually really cheese. It's a cheese-like substance. So they can't call it cheese. That's terrifying. 51% doesn't even sound enough. No, it should be 100% cheese. Yes, it should be cheese if I'm buying right. cheese. That makes sense. Well, is there hope out there? I know there's new dietary guidelines that yeah. are coming out. Is that, is that right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, this is fascinating. So the dietary guidelines have evolved a lot. Since 1977 under McGovern, they were beginning this dietary recommendations for Americans, and it was told us to eat more carbs and less fat and no cholesterol. And this was based on really bad science. And then over the years, they changed it. Then they said eat 6 to 11 servings of bread, rice, cereal, and pasta, the great food pyramid, which shouldn't be called the food pyramid. It should be called the food tombstone. And it essentially killed millions of people. I'm not joking. I really think it has. And now we've sort of moved forward a little bit. In 2015, there were new guidelines that said we should not worry about fat anymore, that we should worry about cholesterol, that we should cut on sugar. But it still missed whole areas of, of important research that didn't review, like low-carbohydrate diets, high-fat diets, and even uh, the fact of saturated fat being an issue or not. And so all these things were sort of ignored. What about meat? They didn't really examine the literature on meat. So there's a process right now until March 30th, and I encourage you to go check out the link to the USDA, which is asking for comments from citizens about the guidelines. And the things that they want to know is, do you think we should look at the data on saturated fat? Do you think we should review the data on meat? Do you think we should review the data on low carbohydrate diets? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You want to go and post yes because, because these are the things that are going to help us really review what the truth is and not get recommendations that don't match the science. The National Academy of Science has actually had uh, reviewed the process by which the guidelines are created. And this was based on Congress mandating the National Academy of Sciences, which is the most independent government board of science, to review how we come up with the guidelines. And what they found was that the guidelines had undue industry influence, meaning they were funders from the Dairy Council and from various uh, in industry groups who were funding the committee members. So they're not exactly independent and impartial. And then they also found that they ignored huge amounts of data. For example, all the data on saturated fat 
They didn't review it. There was so much more data, randomized trials, other interventions, and they just ignored them that exonerate saturated fat as being a problem. Even Dr. Steve Nissen here at the Cleveland Clinic has said to me, Mark, fat's not an issue, and I don't even think saturated fat's an issue. And he's also you know, have, like, helping to advocate for this. This is the top cardiologist in the world, probably, <laughs> here at Cleveland Clinic. So we're really seeing a shift, but the guidelines don't match that. And it's so important because they form the base of all of our recommendations for food programs in this country. And we need to fix that. So I encourage you to go comment on the USDA page for dietary guidelines comments, which is up to March 30th. And we can't undo the chronic diseases that we've, you know, seen in the past right. years, but at least this is a hopeful well, we step. We can, we can, we yeah. can, if we have the right advice, because it informs everything. It informs what doctors say, nutritionists say, the front line says, yeah. what certain hospitals, certain all the food programs, school lunches, all this is determined by these guidelines. So the yeah. guidelines have to actually match science and not industry influence. Do you think that would uh, change the food marketing, which I think is a culprit? Sure, sure. But the problem is that usually what the food companies do is they dial up and down ingredients based on what the guidelines say. So it says eat low fat. I'll say low fat yogurt. Well, low fat yogurt has more sugar per ounce than a can of soda. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Think yeah, about it's it. It's crazy. It's, it's insane stuff. And, uh, and I mean, kudos to you and people like you that are going around and, and spreading the truth, the ugly truth, um, to people and, you know, doing Well, it's these an empowering kind of message. It's empower empowering because people actually can change. They can transform their life. It's not that hard, and you just have to take back your health. Yeah, and it's amazing that what you put in your body completely mm -hmm. can change your health, and that's what you're, you know, advocating. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for, for everything. Is there anything that you want to kind of conclude with? Well, I think people are confused about what to eat. Yeah. And I think that's really why I wrote my book, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And sure. I think it provides a lot of the thinking about what the research is behind this, why we're so confused, a really practical guide on what to eat and what not to eat. Sure. And um, if you guys would like to make an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic functional medicine uh, doctor, you can go to ccf.org slash functioning for life. And if you enjoyed this Facebook Live, make sure you guys are actually following the Cleveland Clinic page and then turn on your notifications as well. And for more health tips and information, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Cleveland Clinic. One word. All right. And One that's more it. thing. One more thing. So she mentioned getting an appointment. What we found is that our Functioning for Life groups, which are groups where you work together with other people, it's a 10-week course, mm -hmm. and you do with others, and you get supported nutritionists, dietitians, doctors. It's really amazing. We're finding people are doing far better doing that than actually the one-on-one -on -one visits because people have a chance to have much more contact with health professionals. They have contact with each other, the peer support or the community relationship sort of action, um, aspect of this is so powerful. So I encourage people to really think about signing up for Functioning for Life. We have different programs for diabetes, for weight, for women's health, for gut issues, autoimmune disease. Really, really powerful model, and I encourage you to check it out. And these are shared medical appointments, shared so there's like 10 patients yeah. around you, and you feel supported because yeah, everybody's exactly. going through different issues exactly. together. Exactly. Great. Well, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.